Good evening. I am the Maven of the Eventide and welcome to Vampire Reviews. You know, vampires don't really do light reading. Everything is dark for vampires. They don't do light anything, so, you know, dark reading. I'm gonna go to bed and do a little dark reading in my coffin, you know, before some shut eye. Yeah, like that. Speaking of reading, Terry Pratchett's Discworld. It is the supernatural kitchen sink comedy slash parody series of the second world fantasy genre, consisting of 41 novels written over 32 years, making sharp, satirical commentary on society while hilariously sending up every fantasy trope and subgenre you've ever heard of. Yes, all of them. So, of course, it includes vampires. In fact, there is an entire region of the disc planet that's specifically devoted to gothic creatures and cliches. Uberwald is the home of vampires, werewolves, mad scientists, and other various and sundry children of the night. Everything dark and spooky you can imagine. Uh, not witches, though. Witches aren't gothic in the disc world, but more of the hometown village wise women and healers. Most of the novels in the series narrow in their focus on one type of trope or classic story archetyped pastiche while incorporating the world building from the previous novels. For instance, the witch characters are first really explored in depth in Weird Sisters, a novel that lampoons all of your favorite Shakespearean tropes. I love Shakespearean nonsense. This is the sixth book in the series, and the friendly neighborhood witches become major recurring characters and sometimes protagonists in the following books, with 11 of the novels revolving specifically around them, including this one, which is a direct parody of Phantom of the Opera and is as awesome as that sounds. Although vampires appear here and there throughout the series as characters, it is the 23rd book, the sixth of the witch books, that's finally fully devoted to taking a deep dive into vampire tropes. This is Carpe Jugulum, which is Latin for seize the throat, a cynical twist on the traditional inspirational message of seize the day, and happens to be the family motto for an antagonistic clan of vampires from Uberwald who decide to take over the neighboring kingdom of Lanker, where the witches live. Gothic hilarity ensues, along with intense sociopolitical commentary, of course. Because when it comes to moralizing on social issues and politics, Sir Terry Pratchett did not hold back. And each of his novels contains a serious life lesson or two at the heart of its humor, distinctly of a liberal feminist bent. Our favorite bent here on Vampire Reviews. And even though the series started in 1983, and this book is over 20 years old, the messages are still poignantly relevant today. For instance, Granny Weatherwax, one of the central witch characters, is introduced in this novel performing a late-term abortion. She's summoned out on her witchly healer duties when a farmer's pregnant wife is kicked by a horse. She realizes that she can only save the life of either the mother or the child. And so Granny chooses to terminate the pregnancy in order to heal the mother. Another person on the scene asks her why she didn't consult the father first to see which life he would have chosen to save. And Granny's like, what the hell is wrong with you? Do, do, do you hate this farmer guy or something? Why would you ever put such a traumatic, horrible choice onto him? Now she even says twice earlier in the conversation that the father has no part in this abortion decision in the first place. Even Death, the person, he's a sentient character in Discworld, shows up for the crucial moment and he tells Granny that he cannot choose which life he's there to take. Besides just taking a political stance on the abortion debate, this scene sets up the main themes of the book. It is distinctly part of Granny's responsibilities as the resident witch to take on the burden of painful choices like this one. And although she's unquestionably a good person, 
She views her place as a witch as necessarily existing somewhere between the light and the dark, as is for the best for her community. There's even a climactic scene later in the book where she almost dies, and she has to choose between going toward the light or the dark. The light means the afterlife in the go towards the light sense. But if she wants to stay alive and serve her community, she needs to choose to go towards the dark. And she's constantly concerned that the dark is a slippery slope towards turning into a bad person, actual evil like a stereotypical witch. The hard choices that echo the dark that witches must make, unfortunately, result in many people in Discworld disliking them, regardless of their good motivations. Granny Weatherwax is respected by her community, but also feared and often judged. She just can't win. Even though her goal is always to save lives and stop evildoers, she's sometimes accused of contributing to the evil. After all, she always seems to be around when evil is discovered and she is a witch with magical powers. Maybe it's her fault somehow. Never mind that the male wizards in this world aren't considered with such suspicion, just the female witches. Because when men do magic, it's noble and academic, but when women do it, it's mysterious and sinister. A commentary on the way society tends to demonize powerful women. Well, after a lifetime of dealing with citizens with this attitude, Granny is tired of having to do so much hard emotional labor with so little appreciation. And in this book, she considers hanging up her pointy hat and giving up the business to go off and be a hermit. Her timing for this is pretty unfortunate for the population that's used to depending on her, though, as she takes off just as the vampire threat rolls into town. Right, enough about witches. This isn't witch reviews. We are here to talk about the vampires. The family of vampires from Uberwald with the Carpe Jugulum motto is the Magpires, consisting of the Count and Countess and their two adult children, Vlad and Lacrimosa. And then they've got a whole crew of subservient vampire underlings tagging along with them. They come to the Kingdom of Lanker at the invitation of the king for his baby's name day party, but the king doesn't realize that once you invite vampires in, you're screwed. And the magpires proceed to hypnotize everyone in the castle with plans to take over the entire kingdom and become the new rulers. It's a political domination coup d'etat which is quite unexpected from the presumably reclusive creatures of the night. But you see, in the tradition of the our vampires are different trope, the magpires aren't like the other vampires. One of the amusing opening lines of the books is, there are many kinds of vampires. Indeed, it is said that there are as many kinds of vampires as there are types of disease. Because, as we've discussed before, every time a vampire story is written, the challenge is to come up with a fresh twist on the genre. They are always being reinvented, and that's part of what this book is parodying. The magpires aren't the type of vampires content to lurk in the shadows for centuries, no, not in dingy gothic settings. These are modern vampires with fancy waistcoats and much loftier ambitions than their predecessors in Uberwald. We learn the old vampires were quite traditional, following just about every single possible hammer horror movie trope, including stupidly filling up their castles with tons of things that could conveniently kill them when vampire slayers happen to hunt them down. Not that vampires in Discworld can truly die, just like evil can never truly die, but they'd be dispatched for a while. But now, without Granny Weatherwax around, the remaining witches are left to try to figure out how to stop the trope subverting magpires without her powerful help. A repeated phrase among them is, everybody who knows anything about vampires knows that garlic works against them, crosses, stakes, coffins, all the things that everyone knows about vampires. And the fact that the witches keep repeating this phrase of meta-awareness as they fight the vampires is an extra layer of meta in itself of all the vampire media like Lost Boys and Fright Night and so on, where characters resort to their knowledge of fiction to fight vampires that are, surprise, real in their universe. The problem for the people in this book, though, is that the vampires are well aware of all these tropes, too. 
And the subversion of the tropes isn't that they're not all true, they are, but because they are, the Magpire family has made an effort to systematically train themselves to overcome all these traditional vampire weaknesses. They've built up an immunity, and garlic, sunlight, religious symbols no longer work on them, even though they were deadly to their ancestors. Count de Magpire constantly derides his ancestor, the Old Count and his classical gothic ways. Besides just issuing creaky doors and torches and cobwebs in favor of being shiny and modern and classy, part of the young Count's effort to be more sophisticated and progressive in his vampire lifestyle is also the way his family treats their victims. Because they are still vampires after all, they do still need to drink blood. They don't do such ghastly things as abduct maidens and nightgowns from their bedrooms or swoop down upon the villages without warning to terrorize the night. Goodness, no! How gauche! And at first, this does actually seem like it might be a good thing for the people, right? Vampires acting less like vampires? Until the witches find out how these new vampires do get their blood. As the governing body of their land, they've made an arrangement with the village below their castle that they plan to extend to Lanker when they take over its government. Every time they need blood, all the villagers above the age of 12 line up in an orderly fashion to serve as a buffet line of victims. This method horrifies the witches as they see how the vampires treat people as things brainwashing their human servants or siring them into lower rung vampires who must obey the vampire masters, all the while boasting that they are improving these people's lives because they were so poor and aimless before the vampires came along. These vampires are the very embodiment of the imperialist ideology of colonizers, justifying their supremacy as beneficial to the civilizations they oppress and assimilate even verging into eugenics as they drive out and eliminate all the other kinds of magical creatures from Uberwald, like centaurs and trolls and pixies, calling them lower races in order to develop a more fashionable, civilized society. Meanwhile, they're still literally drinking their subjects' blood and controlling their minds. What's a little blood in exchange for the good of the community, they say. But as one which replies, you're just saying that in exchange for not actually being evil, you'll simply be bad. They say that they want vampires and humans in harmony, but to them, harmony means complete power over the humans. They genuinely think they're being kind and generous, that enslavement is improving these people's lives. And then when the villagers revolt against them at the end with the witch's help, the vampires are shocked at their ingratitude. Their surprise quickly turns to violence, though, as they start slaughtering the people that they were so interested in helping before, demonstrating the falseness, the sheer absurdity of the notion of the nice supremacist. The interesting twist at the end of the story, though, where it gets really deep, isn't that the people want to destroy all vampires completely. Throughout it, They've actually been pining for the good old days of the classic gothic vampires who used to haunt them before the magpires changed things. The old count was still a villain, but he never expected the people to actually like him. He never pretended not to be a monster. And most importantly, he never tried to implement his oppressive ideologies on a government level. The villagers want the magpires out and the old count back, and Granny Weatherwax is all for letting the old count stay. People need vampires, she says. They help them remember what steaks and garlic are for. After all, there will always be some kind of evil in the world, so best to have the kind that is obvious about what it is so that people will stay conscious of how to stand up against it. The magpires represent the kind of institutionalized evil disguised as progress that society can become complacent about. And if that happens, people will forget how to fight it, forget what the steaks and garlic are for. There's a scene where the witches see children going off with the lynch mob after the vampires, and one of them's worried that the kids are going to get traumatized, but another points out that this will teach the children how to defeat their nightmares. Teach your children, Granny says. Don't trust the cannibal just because he's using a knife and fork. Public perception of evil matters. 
vampires in Discworld can't truly be killed. They'll always come back. But also, even if vampires stopped existing, it's not like all evil would stop. These vampires aren't just individual bad actors. They're a systemic problem that the culture of their land was built around. Having around a ridiculous sort of monstrous evil, like the cliche, trope-tastic, super gothic old vampire count, is good for keeping people on guard for other subtler sorts of evil. Like corrupt politicians, abusive laws, governments that deny individuals basic human rights. And obviously, it's not just about the allegory of Discworld needing literal vampires in its magical fantasy reality, but also about us needing vampires in the real world, in our media. In books like this, we need fictional metaphorical representations of monsters to help us critically examine the real-life social issues they represent. You know, the whole premise of our show here. As much as this book's poking fun at the cliches, it's making a statement on why vampire media itself is important. Because if it's not vampires preying on society, it's gonna be someone else. Remember, Granny says, vampires don't go where they're not invited. Like saying both sides of an argument are valid even when one side wants to deny human rights. Inviting that discourse in and the complacency that results once it's allowed paves the way for evil ideology to grow. Maybe it doesn't affect you in any way, but it's not always about you. Just because much of society has progressed doesn't mean problems like racism and supremacy and inequality are over. Don't get complacent in your progressive bubble. Keep your lynch mob skills sharp. Protest. Call your senators. Educate children about past injustices, oppression, imperialist ideologies. Otherwise, history will repeat itself. You know, just generally speaking, it's not like there's anything in particular going on in our world nowadays where the lessons this book is imparting might be painfully relevant. When this book says don't invite vampires in, what it's really warning about is against allowing anyone who wants to deny human rights to have a voice in the conversation at all. And to bring this all back to the beginning with the themes set up with the witches, it is so easy for people to lose sight of the kind of systemic oppression that does need fighting when society spends so much time being preoccupied with judging and fearing people like the witches. These powerful women who have the burden of being responsible for making difficult choices for the actual benefit of their community, but so obviously are on the right side of history when compared to the vampires. Granny Weatherwax realizes that abandoning her ungrateful community to go off and become a hermit is the wrong choice. Unlike the vampires who turned murderous as soon as the people stopped appreciating them, Granny returns and saves the day, using the vampires' own trope subversions against them. When talking about the areas between good and evil, black and white, Granny says, there's no grays, only white that's got grubby. She's caught between light and dark in her position as a witch, but in the end, those gray areas are still white, still on the side of good. The only true sin in the black, she says, is when you treat people as things. Even though Granny makes a selfish choice in the beginning of the book, she needed that moment of failure in order to get to a place where she could stop the vampires. They bite her and try to turn her into one of them. And she's only able to resist the change into becoming a supremacist herself after she looks inside herself and faces the grubbier side of her nature. The vampire is within us all on some level. We all have some capacity for darkness, to treat people like things. And we need to face this first and understand it before we can defeat it. Self-awareness is necessary. A lot like how having meta-awareness of vampire media comes in quite handy when suddenly, surprise, real vampires exist and you need to defeat them. The book ends with a metaphor about winter ending and spring coming. It says, the year was heading away from the dark. Society really is progressing, human rights for all, racism and misogyny are over. But then it adds, of course, the dark would come again, but that was the nature of the world. It's cynical, but pragmatic. Just as the seasons turn, history will repeat itself. Governing bodies trying to turn people into things will rise again, have already risen. 
Maybe the vampires aren't at your doorstep yet, but we better still remember what the steaks and garlic are for when they get here. I am the Maven of the Eventide, and this book is 21 years old, but it's also only 21 years old. With the way society's heading lately, we aren't going to stop needing vampire lessons like this anytime soon. So thank you, Sir Terry Pratchett. May you continue educating us from beyond the grave for eons to come. Vampire Reviews is made possible by my Patreon patrons. Thank you so much to all of my Patreon patrons for supporting me. Especially to the one who requested that I review Carpe Jugulum, and to the other one of you out there who sent this book to me in the mail so that I actually have a physical copy and, you know, can love it at night. If you would like to support me but don't want to be a Patreon patron, consider checking out my book, the one that I wrote, The Company of Death. Uh, you can find it on Audible or any other audiobook provider or Kindle or, you know, actually get the physical book if you're into that. It is a book about death going on an adventure. And, you know, some people have actually compared the way I write death to the way that Sir Terry Pratchett writes death, which I take as a compliment, even though I didn't read any Terry Pratchett until after I'd written this, you know. It's, you know, great minds think alike, apparently. <laughs> like my mind would ever be anywhere close to his. Thank you again. Good night.